All right, back on the record in the uh, Simpson matter, Mr. Simpson is again present before the court with his counsel, Mr. Shapiro, Mr. Cochran, Mr. Blazer, Mr. Neufeld, Mr. Sheck, people represented by Mr. Darden and Mr. Goldberg. Jury is not present. Counsel, anything we need to take up before we invite the jurors to join us? Mr. Shapiro, good morning, sir. Good morning, Your Honor. Your Honor, uh, this morning I privately apologized uh, to Mr. Dennis Fung for some remarks uh, that I made outside of court. And I want to publicly apologize to him and to all my friends in the Asian American community that uh, last week friends of ours from a Chinese restaurant that we frequent sent us some fortune cookies. They were at the council table uh, when I arrived after lunch on Thursday. I had one and uh, offered some to uh, two members of the press and then made a remark which was meant to be facetious and was taken by those who received it as being facetious. However, I understand the sensitivities of people and in hindsight, those remarks could have been misconstrued as being something other than just in humor and being a pun. As your honor knows, uh, me for a long period of time, my career has been based on representing individuals who are primarily of minority groups. And I harbor no racial bias towards any group or any community uh, in the world. Uh, my heart has been heavy all weekend if even one person has been offended. And for that, I sincerely apologize. Mr. Cochran, uh, today I understand, was also uh, reported as having passed out fortune cookies. He has not. Uh, I was the only one responsible. But on behalf of myself and Mr. Cochran, both of us, through our careers, have uh, built a solid reputation representing uh, minority groups of which we are both a part. And therefore, if any person or persons was offended, my sincere and most humble apologies uh, are given, and especially to Mr. Fung. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, Mr. Shapiro. All right, counsel, I understand we have an issue to resolve regarding videotapes. Do we need to view those? Yes. All right, what's the nature of this videotape, Mr. Uh, Goldberg? Your Honor, we received another videotape depicting events at Rockingham with a time counter in it. And uh, it depicts some of the same events that we've already seen from different angles, and in our view, better angles. And uh, one new event that was not seen on the other videotapes. We would like to use it and also use it in conjunction with the time counter to show when those events occurred. We provided uh, the defense with a beta copy of that tape which apparently they have not viewed because they don't have a uh, beta tape player. So that's where we are. All right, Mr. Sheck. Yes, I understand your Morning, sir. Uh, we would like to avail ourselves of the opportunity to look at that in chambers and confer among ourselves. Since it's new footage, we haven't seen it. All right, is there any disagreement as to, I, I see we have Mr. Coogan here uh, from KBC. Is there any dispute as to the foundation or you don't know until you see it. All right, so we're going to have to sit and watch this for 25 minutes. I, I didn't hear what the answer was to the speed of the foundation. Was that the no, they indicated they wanted, wanted to see it first before we dealt with any foundational issues. All right, then we'll stand in recess until uh, council have had the opportunity to review this new videotape. I'll make my uh, VHS available to you. All right. All parties are again present, and counsel, you've had the opportunity to review the uh, VHS version of the uh, tape from uh, KBC News. Mr. Cochran, Mr. Sheck, any comment?
we, we've uh, viewed the tape. It's uh, certainly enlightening. Um, the, uh, in terms of the times, uh, I think it's the uh, best recollection of Mr. Coogan that uh, in terms of the process by which he sets the times, he doesn't think it would be off by more than 30 or 40 seconds. Have an, uh, uh, an abundance of caution, but uh, in an estimate that he, uh, I think, doesn't believe would really be accurate, he has uh, indicated uh, it could be off as much as five minutes. Uh, frankly, I think that we should go with his best recollection. Uh, and stipulate in terms of exactly what he did. That do you is want to stipulate, say he, or do you want to have a uh, hearing outside the presence of the jury? Mr. Coogan's here with his counsel. No, no, I'm just talking about the times. I'm, I'm saying he submitted an affidavit that said it could be off by as much as five minutes, but in talking with him, I think the prosecution will agree uh, his best uh, estimate is really no more than 30 or 40 seconds. So uh, I'd rather go with that. Right, I Mr. think that's his best recollection. Mr. Goldberg, what's your position? Well, I think we should just go with what he said, and we could probably just ask him exactly what he said and then stipulate to that, which is I believe that he looks at the clock in the station, which is apparently highly accurate, uh, periodically and sets his watch by that clock so that his best statement as to how far off he is. All right. Well, let me ask you this. Do we have a stipulation or do we have to put something on the record? Well, I know, I know we never had an opportunity to discuss it with counsel. Uh, so like agreed on the time. That's, that's his best recollection. But that, but that out of an abundance of caution, it could conceivably be off by as much as, as five minutes. No. But that's a very, as I think he no. said, I'd rather go, best estimate. I'd rather go with what his best recollection of what happened is rather than any guesses. That's all. That's, I mean, that's what I would propose to stipulate to. All right. Is that stipulation acceptable to the people, the 30 to 40? call Mr. Coogan out of order in front of the jury to lay the foundation? Well, maybe, maybe if counsel and I sit down with Mr. Coogan, we can come up with an exact, but that's sort of precisely word that's Mr. Coogan, come on up. And counsel, your name for the record? Stephen Perry from Motor Tells Council. All right, good morning, counsel. Good morning. All right, counsel, why don't you confer with Mr. Coogan and see if we can uh, save some time here.
Uh, Mr. Sheck, have we agreed upon a stipulation regarding the time stamp? I believe we have, Your Honor. Mr. Goldberg? Yes. The, the proposed stipulation is that Mr. Coogan be deemed to have been called, duly sworn, and testified that he uh, makes it his practice to check his personal watch, his wristwatch, against the station clock, which he does every two to three weeks, and sets them. That when he does this, that he notices that he is off by no more than 30 to 40 seconds. That he told the camera woman on uh, June the 13th, who shot the uh, video, tape uh, images that we're going to be showing to set the camera's clock and that it was set against his watch, that the items, uh, that the, the uh, various clips are in sequence and that the clock and the camera continues to run after the camera is off. All right, is that stipulation acceptable to the uh, prosecution? To the uh, excuse me, to the defense. <laughs> Yes. All right, then that's accepted by the court, and Mr. Uh, Goldberg, you can offer that stipulation before the jury, is that correct? Yes. All right. Your Honor, before uh, Mr. Perry and Mr. Coogan leave, uh, we had subpoenaed um, uh, footage um, and outtakes from Bundy, um, and uh, uh, we have a, some concern about selective production. We would ask that the court order uh, KABC to turn over to us uh, their outtakes um, from Bundy, if they're going to be turning over the outtakes from Rockingham, I think in the interests of getting to the truth here, we should, uh, I'd ask the court to order them to turn over their outtakes from Bundy. Well, that's, that would be in the form of a formal motion on written notice, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not inclined to do that without a uh, formal motion. No. Out, outtakes being a hot topic of I mean, uh, uh, I think, Your Honor, the, the when we subpoena them, we don't get we don't get them, but the, these are turned over. I mean, I just think in, in fairness. Uh, well, counsel, I, I agree with you disclosure. that maybe there's an issue here, but okay. you need a notice motion before I start. Right. Well, this just came up. <laughs> okay. Um, You've got uh, counsel's card. I do. I do. Yeah. You know where okay. to find him. Yeah, I have one more motion. One All right. More. Thank you, counsel. Thank you, Mr. Coogan. One more request before yes, the uh, jury is brought back, and that is I uh, took a look at uh, the court's uh, proposed uh, charge with respect to the um, page four of the Rockingham checklist, as you wrote it, and made one, uh, uh, two small uh, additions um, concerning the fact that- All right, counsel indicated we're gonna take up these matters on Wednesday. Well, Your Honor, if, if I may. Uh, I'd ask you to peruse this and take a look at it for this reason, and that no, is. Counsel, we're going to discuss this on May. That's the end of the subject. Your Honor, me, on Wednesday. Right. That's could the I end of the could I just have this alternative marked? And I would just like to make this record, Your Honor. No. It, would, it won't take very long. It take a few minutes, Your Honor. I think that I Mr. was. Mr. Sheck, I'm going to tell you for the fourth time. No. Sit down. All right. Let's have the jury. physical custody of that. Mrs. Robertson, do you have that tape now? Let the record reflect. We've been rejoined by all the members of our jury panel. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, let me uh, apologize to you again. Mr. Fung, would you have a seat, please? 
Let me apologize to you again for our late start this morning. Uh, we had some matters that uh, I had to take up out of your presence. I did not anticipate that they would take so long. Um, I trust we all had an interesting and entertaining weekend. Good. All right. Thank you. Uh, also, at the uh, because we've lost some time this morning, we're going to reconvene at 1 o'clock rather than our usual 1.30, so a little quicker lunch hour, but uh, I'd like to get as much time in front of the jury as possible. Also, some matters have come up that have been brought to my attention regarding specifically issues that impact our jurors, and it will be necessary for me to talk to each one of you individually, and I'm going to start that process this afternoon. Uh, so when we recess court for the day, I'm going to call you in one at a time. I anticipate being able to get to perhaps maybe three or four of you uh, every afternoon between 4.30 and 6 uh, for the next several days, and I'll take you in order starting with juror number one, and I need to discuss some matters with you, each of you privately with the, a few of the lawyers present. So just so you understand what will be going on. All right, Mr. Fong. Dennis Fung is again on the witness stand undergoing redirect examination by Mr. Goldberg. Good morning again, Mr. Fung. Good morning. You're reminded, sir, you're still under oath. And Mr. Goldberg, do we have the tape? Mr. Sheck, do we have the tape? The tape. Did you leave it in the machine? I think we just left your copy. Bottom machine. Perhaps I can mark that now while we're getting it. And then well, I want to make sure that Ms. Robertson's got physical custody of the tape. Okay. Advises me there is no tape in the machine. All right. Mr. Goldberg. I'd like to uh, mark this my next exhibit in order, I believe. It's 186. All right, People's 186 videotape. Yes. And I, I believe it depicts some footage at uh, the Rockingham location. All right, you may proceed. Your Honor, I wanted to uh, show this tape as my next exhibit, but may I offer the stipulation now? Yes. Okay. Counsel, will you stipulate that Mark, uh, Mark Coogan of KABC be deemed to have been called duly sworn and testified that People's 186 is a uh, videotape that was shot on June the 13th of 1994, that he uh, makes it his practice to check his personal watch against the station clock, which he does every two to three weeks in order to uh, set them. 
that when he does this, he has noticed that he is off by no more than 30 to 40 seconds, that he told the camera woman that shot this tape to turn on the clock inside the camera, which was set against his watch. The sequences contained in the tape are in sequence chronologically, and that the clock on the camera continues to roll even when the camera is off. Yes, that's what Mr. Coogan would testify to. All right, stipulation is accepted by the court. Ladies and gentlemen, as I told you when we began the trial, a stipulation uh, between the attorneys is an agreement between the parties as to certain facts. You were to accept those facts as being true. All right, Mr. Goldberg, you may proceed. I'd like to uh, play portions of the tape. All right, and let's make sure monitor in the front is working. Chair number one, is that? Stop it for just one minute. Okay, it's at uh, 1712. 1712. Now, now, Mr. Fung, at this point in the videotape, what has just happened? Criminalist Mazzola and I have just taken back the evidence and placed it into the crime scene truck. And 1712 is uh, 512? Yes. Okay. All right, perhaps we can continue now, Mr. Fertlow. We can rewind that and take a look at that again. This is at uh, 1717, Mr. Fung, which would be uh, 517 in the evening. Yes. Do, do you recognize anything about the item that Detective Van Adder was holding? Maybe we can rewind that again. Go, can we go slowly? That can we get it right when it flipped back? Right when the item flipped back? We could go in slow motion, possibly. Now look carefully, Mr. Fung, for when the wind pushes the top of the item back. Okay, there, there. Just one frame, one frame or two frames back, there. All right, 17, 17, 07, and 17 on the counter. Can we get a better still, still on that? Yeah, right there. Right there. there. 
that one. It was a, a few, about two, two, uh, Is it possible to print that out, Mr. Fertlow? You know, perhaps we could have the printout marked as 186A. All right, just so the record's uh, complete, this is frame 171707 sub 20 on the counter. To approach the witness uh, and show him People's 163H again, if I may. You may. Sir, I'm showing you 163H again. Can you hold up the item there that constitutes the type of gray envelope into which reference samples are placed and show the jury? Okay, now, if you look at the reverse side of that, is that the way these envelopes typically appear? Yes. And they have a they have a little clasp. There's a clasp with a hole in the flap section of the envelope. And when you worked in toxicology at the Los Angeles Police Department, did you see these kinds of envelopes on a uh, regular basis? Yes. And <clears throat> what does the item in Detective Van Adder's hand appear to be to you? It appears to be a gray analyzed, env analyzed evidence envelope that typically holds biological uh, specimens. Your Honor, maybe I'll, I can place a 186A on the reverse side of this. You may. Okay. Let's continue with, with the tape if we can, Mr. Fairbairn. Maybe we can back up again, Mr. Fertlow, and take another look at the sequence of uh, inside the foyer area.
Stop. Can you back up for just a few frames? Okay, one, one or two frames forward. There. Can, can you go like two frames forward? Okay, there. Stop. Can we get a print of that, uh, Mr. Fertla? That's at 171857, Your Honor. 12. Yes. <laughs> you want to mark print out of this frame 186B? Yes, Your Honor. Now, Mr. Fung, did you have the opportunity to take a look at this uh, videotape yesterday several yes. times? And what does the item in your hand appear? What, what is the item in your hand? The there are two things I am carrying. One is a plastic bag, and the other is an envelope. Did this refresh your recollection, sir, as to where you were at the time that you received the envelope from Mr. Van Adder? Yes, it did. Where was that? That was in the foyer at Rockingham. Let's continue with this, this tape, if we can very slowly, Mr. Fertlow. Mr. Fertlow, can, can you see if you can get that second zoom in that we just saw a few frames back? Right there. Several frames forward to here, Mr. Fairless. Okay, can we back up for a moment?
Okay, Mr. Ferret, look, can you see if you can clear up this image at 17, 18, 57, 17? Just a few frames before this. 17 on the last counter. Reverse thing a little bit. Let's see if we can get a shot of it that way. Isn't this the first sequence? No, this is the second. The second sequence of the uh, foyer. I think this is the first sequence. Forward to it to seven to seventeen, eighteen fifty seven. I mean, uh, I think it was, was right before this that there was another shot of the, the uh, well. 17, 18, is something that is People's 186B we printed. Yeah, that's, that's tw 57, 12. Okay. And it's, it's slightly after that there's, there's another. Let's, let's do it this way. Let's start and just run it through in real time. Okay. Or from the, the, the beginning of the sequence of uh, the foyer. Now we're at 17, 19, 40. In these frames, can you still see the items in your hand? Yes. And what are those items, Mr. Fung? The items appear to be a, an envelope and a plastic bag. And the plastic bag is, w which plastic bag is that? That is the plastic bag that Ms. Mazzola carried out to the crime scene truck on the second trip. Okay. 
and the uh, envelope is? The envelope is the envelope which contain, contained the blood vial given to me by Detective Van Etter. Now, sir, the, the gentleman who has his back to the door, to the camera, do you know who he is? Yes, he's a LAPD photographer, uh, Mr. Wilson. Now, Sir, as you sit here today, independent of what you've seen on the videotape, do you have an, a recollection of Mr. Wilson being there? I know that he was in the area, but I don't know how close, closely he was watching. From your own independent recollection? From my independent recollection. Were you paying attention to who was around you at the time that this transaction occurred? No. Mr. Ferret, let me, we can continue. Maybe we can just stop for one moment. We're at 1742-5322, is that correct, Mr. Fung? Yes. And this is a shot of what happening? This is a shot of criminal Mazzola and myself leaving the Rockingham address. Okay. You can continue forward. Let's just stop for a moment. M Mr. Fung, um, do you have an independent recollection as you sit here today of placing the item that you received from Detective Van Adder, the envelope, into the plastic bag? Not an independent recollection, no. Okay. And when you looked at the scene of Andrea Mazzola taking the plastic bag out of the location. Was there anything that you collected between uh, 5 o'clock and when you left with Andrea Mazzola that could have accounted for the heft in that bag other than the envelope? 
possibly. But it's most likely that the envelope was in that bag. Okay. No, let's get Oh, well. Did, did you collect anything uh, between 5 o'clock and the time that, that Ms. Mazzola and yourself left with the plastic bag that was the same approximate size and dimension of the analyzed envelope 163? Was there anything? The one in front of you. Was there anything else that we collected that was this size? Yes. Is that what you're asking? No. And did you have any other envelopes that were that size? No. Okay. Let's continue. Your Honor, perhaps uh, I think we've covered the scenes that, that I want to cover at this time. Mr. Ferretwell, it's fine. So, sir, based upon your uh, independent recollection and also viewing the videotapes, is the uh, first event that occurred uh, with respect to the vial, Detective Van Adder arriving with what appears to be the analyzed evidence envelope? Yes. And did you then see a shot of yourself in the foyer area? holding two items. Yes. And those two items were, again? The two items were an envelope that is consistent with the gray envelope in people's 163H. 163H and a plastic bag. And that was, in fact, the envelope that you received from Detective Van Adder? Yes. And the plastic bag was the one that eventually Ms. Mazzola was carrying? Yes. And then the third item in the sequence of events is uh, Andrea Mazzola carrying the, the black plastic bag out of the location? Yes. And, the, and you're putting it into the crime scene truck? Yes. finished with that, that tape. Sir, I was asking you about independent recollection of placing the item in the bag. And you said that you don't have an independent recollection of that. What do you mean by that? By independent recollection, I don't have a mental picture from memory of myself placing the envelope in the plastic bag. So when you're thinking about the events of the 13th and you're trying to conjure up an image, think of an image of what was happening at and around the time that you received the envelope, do you see an image of yourself doing that? Not from my memory, no. Okay. But do you know that that's what you did? Yes. And how do you know that? from viewing the videotape and piecing together memory that I do remember, that's what I have concluded that I, have, that I did. Okay. Did you also look at the time? Speculation, I think, the tapes and what the witness says speak for itself. Oh, well. Thank you. Now, sir, we were uh, talking before we broke on Friday about what collection means as a criminalist, and, and you said that it meant something in addition to physically picking items up. Is that correct? Yes. And did that include the, the numbering and the measuring phase? Yes. All right. And I asked you whether, in your mind, you participated, or whether you did participate in the collection of all of the items on June the 13th, uh, all the biological evidence. 
And what was your answer? The answer was yes. Right. Now, when you were working with uh, Andrea Mazzola on the 13th, I think you testified that you were working as a team. What do you mean by that? In working as a team, two people are working towards one goal. And we were working towards collecting and documenting the evidence that was at those scenes. All right. Now, when you testified at the grand jury, did you have any uh, opportunity to prepare by talking with Marsha Clark before you testified? No. Have you ever testified at a grand jury before? No. Did you have an opportunity to prepare on your own by reviewing your own uh, notes in order to refresh your recollection before you testified? I looked at them briefly. Did you have any conversation with Ms. Clark before you actually went into the grand jury room? We had a brief conversation as to the basic, basic testimony I would be covering, the topics we would be covering, but it was nothing very detailed. Well, can you give us a, a better idea of what was said? She said she introduced herself and I introduced myself she said something to the effect, you're the criminalist who did the collection. I said yes, and there wasn't much more than that, if okay. any. And uh, you've testified in court on numerous prior occasions? Yes. Do you usually have an opportunity to sit down and, and go over your, your testimony in advance and know the kinds of questions you're going to be asked and so, and so on? Usually. And to review your notes? Yes. Right. Now, uh, I want to ask you some questions about your testimony <coughs> at the grand jury, sir. So I'm going to be looking at page 390 of the grand jury transcript. So you have since had an opportunity to go over your grand jury transcript testimony? Yes. Okay. And at the grand jury, did you uh, give the following answers to the following questions, starting on page 389, line 23? Question, with respect to the blood on the car shown in photograph A of People's Five, as well as B, and the blood behind the Ford Bronco shown with number four in the photograph, C, and the blood shown in photograph F on this exhibit, and a photograph, that same drop of blood shown in photograph D of People's Two. In fact, all of the blood recovered as shown on the markers in, in People's Two in G and F, as well as five in photograph G and H. Did you recover all of those from the scene for further analysis? Answer, the ones labeled with the numbers, yes, I did. Question, how did you recover them? Answer. I recovered them in the manner described before, where I would wet a cloth swatch or several cloth swatches if needed, apply, to the red, apply it to the red stain, and then let the stain transfer onto the cloth swatch. Do you remember giving that ans those answers to those questions? Yes. 
And when the, the question was asked, and how did you recover them, did you believe the questioner wanted to know how they were recovered or who did it? I believe the questioner wanted to know how it was done. Were you trying to mislead anyone when you talked about in the first person, I did it? No. Your Honor, I'd, I'd next like to read a, a reference from the same transcript at page 399. Starting at line Starting five. line 5 through line 12. And Your Honor might want to take a look at that because that's going to bring us to a, another issue. If, if the court has the transcript. All right, let's approach with the court reporter, please.
sir at the grand jury hearing where you asked a question as to the collection of stain number fourteen in the master bedroom master bathroom rather and did you say that we collected that stain in the master bathroom yes and when you said we collected it who was this other person that you were referring to I was referring to criminals Mazzola and did uh, was there a follow-up question of who who is the other person no okay and next I'd like to look at the grand jury transcript page 408 at lines 9 through 13, Your Honor. Sir, were you asked the, the following question, and did you give the following answer? Was the blood between the two victims analyzed, either the blood on the floor, on the ground between the two victims analyzed or collected for analysis? Answer, we did collect or try to collect blood, that blood, and it was analyzed, yes. Do you remember that? Yes. And when you said we, who were you referring to? I was referring to criminals Mazzola and myself. And it was, was a follow-up question as to who is the other person asked? No. Now, did it appear to you, based on the questions you were being asked at the grand jury, that the questioner was interested in who did what or what was done? Sustained. What did it appear to you that the questioner was interested in when you were being questioned about Sustained. what was collected? Sustained. Calls for speculation. May, may, I, may we, we approach on that, Your Honor? No. Proceed. Proceed. Okay. Were you ever trying to mislead anyone at the grand jury? No. And when you went through the uh, transcript, did you come up with an estimate as to approximately how many minutes you were questioned about the collection process at Rockingham in terms of what was collected and how it was collected? A little rough estimation of, of between five to ten minutes. It wasn't that extensive? No. And what about the collection process at Bundy, approximately? Five to ten minutes again. And in your review of the transcript, were you ever asked specifically who, the question who did this or who did that in terms of collecting evidence at Bundy? No, not specifically or Rockingham? No. Now, I'd like next to refer to the preliminary hearing transcript at page 40. at lines five through 10. Were you asked the following questions and did you give the following answers? Question, did you prepare a report documenting what item numbers one through eight are in this case? Answer, yes I did. Question, did you collect them sir? Answer, I did, along with my assistant, criminalist Mazzola. Did you give those answers to that question? Yes. Were you making any effort to conceal criminalist Mazzola's participation in the collection in this case? No. 
did you have any hesitation to, to say that you collected them along with criminalist Mazzola at the preliminary hearing? No. And I'd like next to look at pages 43 through 44. Lines 27 on page 43 through line 3 on page 44. Twenty-seven on forty-three, through line three on page forty-four. Proceed. Proceed. Okay. Question: And were all of those items packaged by yourself, bearing the DR number of this case? Answer: Yes. I may have had some assistance from criminalist Mazzola with some of the items. Do you recall giving that answer to that question? Yes. Okay. And, and by the way, when we're talking about DR number being assigned, that is what? That is the divisional record number that is assigned to each case. Each case has its own DR number. And those were assigned in the field or, or in the laboratory? The, uh, the detective obtains those, and he passes the DR number on to us. Now, when you were answering this question about having assistance from criminal Liz Mazzola in the packaging uh, with the DR numbers, did you have any hesitation in disclosing that she assisted you in that process? No. I'd next like to refer to the, what we've been terming the Griffin hearing, which happened on August the 22nd of last year at page 52, excuse me, page uh, 538. I'd object to this. This is not. All right, let me see counsel to sidebar with the transcript. Sir, did you give the following responses to the following questions? Uh, question. And so she would be collecting some of those blood stains. I mean, I withdraw that question. As you sit here today, do you have a vivid memory as to which of the 60 or so items that you collected at Bundy she collected in your presence as opposed to those which were collected outside your presence? Answer. I do remember that the blood stains leading from the where the victims were along the escape route, as it has been referred to in the past, is I was there with her personally supervising her. Question for each and every one of those. Answer, I believe so. Yes. Question, were there other blood stains, however, that she collected at the scene that you personally did not supervise? Answer, yes. And as you sit here today, do you know which ones those were? Not specifically, no. Do you remember? The, those answers to those questions? Yes. Okay. Now, were you indicating when you said, I believe so, yes, that you supervised her on the trail items, that you were positive? 
when I said I believe so, that meant that I wasn't 100 percent sure. And you have since testified that you did not observe her on stain 52. That's correct. And how did you come? To, did you come to that conclusion after your conversation with Andrea Mazzola, where you went through the checklist or before? I came to that conclusion after I spoke with criminalist Mazzola. Were you trying to mislead anyone at the Griffin hearing about what you observed and what you didn't observe in terms of uh, what Ms. Mazzola did? No. Now, in this case, you also uh, filled out property reports documenting the evidence that was collected on June the 13th. Is that correct? Yes. Your Honor, at this time, I'd like to mark as people's next in order. I believe it's 169. 187. 187. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. A copy of a uh, property report containing items one through ten. All right, and how many pages is this document? It's three pages. All right. Have you shown that to Mr. Sheck? Uh, excuse me, it actually contains one through uh, uh, fourteen and then seventeen. All right, proceed. And I have another report that I'd like to mark as People's 188. And it contains items 35 through 37. How many pages? It's also three pages. All right, 188. Five pages. Proceed. Thank that you generated in this case created uh, before June the 16th? Yes. And that was before your testimony at the grand jury? Yes. I'd like to uh, direct your attention to the, the report that we've now marked as 187 for identification. Your Honor, I just put a 187 up in the, on the top of the report and circled it. All right. And specifically, page uh, three of that report. <clears throat> One, please. Sir, on this report, did you write that items 1 through 11 were collected by criminalists Mazzola and Fung on 614-94 at 360 North Rockingham? Yes, I did. And did you subsequently write a, uh, another document to change the date to 613? Yes. Right. And when you wrote this document, did you have any hesitation to list criminalists Mazzola as being one of the people that collected the items with you? No. 
I'd now like to direct your attention to the, the next exhibit that we've marked, uh, People's 188, the fourth page. And on this report, sir, is this another one of your property reports? Yes, it is. And this was generated before the uh, grand jury? Before I testified before that, yes. And did that say that items 35 through 57 were collected by criminalists Mazzola and Fung on 613 at 875 South Bundy? Yes. And did you have any hesitation whatsoever to list criminalist Mazzola as having participated in the collection of those items? No, I did not. All right, thank you. So before you testified at the grand jury, as far as you were concerned, was it a matter of public record in these property reports that criminalist Mazzola and yourself collected the items on June the 13th? Sustained. Did you know that these reports were in existence yes, at the I time did. that you testified at the grand jury? Yes. Your Honor, I'd now like to mark another exhibit. And it appears to be a vehicle search checklist dated um, 612. And it's L21 through L31 as people's 189. 189. How many pages? seven pages. Thank you. I'm only going to ask him about one page of this report. All right. Proceed. You may. Sir, can you just briefly look at this uh, exhibit and tell us what that is? This is the vehicle search checklist that we've filled out to, in conjunction with doing the Bronco search. Uh, sir, what, this says 612. What, what date was this filled out on? This was filled out on 613. And who did that? Criminal Mazzola filled out this form. When? When on the uh, 13th was that filled out? This was filled out very shortly after we arrived at the Rockingham scene. And in the, uh, well, I'm having trouble seeing it, but on the OIC box, maybe you can, OIC, okay. 
Maybe we can zoom in on that. The OIC box, it says Mazzola, and, and it has the date 613 over to the, uh, the right. Yes, it does. And then under that, it actually says assistance name, defung. Yes. Now, how much after you arrived at Rockingham was this document actually filled out? Not more than five to ten minutes. Did you have any conversation with uh, Ms. Mazzola about who to put in the OIC section or who to put in the assistance name section? No, not on this form. Right. And when did you first become aware that she was the OIC is listed on this form and that you were the assistant? Listed as the assistant. I, when I was reviewing the notes at uh, some later time, okay. I looked at that and noticed it then. Did you ever make any effort to change that? No. Did it bother you that, that Andrea Mazzola was listed in the OIC position? No. Did it ever occur to you to ask Andrea Mazzola to write up a new form to switch the names to put yourself in the OIC position and switch her to assistant? No. Okay. And did you know that this document was in existence when you testified at the grand jury? Yes, I did. Now, sir, have you noticed in your experience as a criminalist when someone asks you the question, did you collect a particular item of evidence in a case where you were working with a criminalist one who may have done the actual physical picking up, have you noticed any particular habit that you have? I haven't finished. Meeting. Hold on. Argumentative. Not yet. Do you have any habit with respect to how you answer that question? Oh, well, you can answer the question. Yes. In reviewing some of my testimony, I tend to use the word I in that situation. Um, in an example, well, there's many examples that you've given today, and it's like an engineer who says, I built a bridge, or a businessman who says, I wrote a report, when he may actually have many other people working under him, helping him finish his job. Did you have the opportunity to review portions of your trial transcript in this case and see yourself following that uh, practice? What's the objection? The objection is... Legal is, basis. The basis is, I believe it's... Legal ground. Two words. Leading compound and assumes facts not in evidence. Sustained. Just deleting. Did you have an opportunity to review your portions of your trial transcript? Yes. And were there instances in the trial transcript where you uh, testified as if you had done the physical collection when you didn't? Sustained. Rephrase the question. Did you find any instances of your answering questions in conformity with the habit that you just described to us? Yes. All right. Your Honor, I'd like to um, direct counsel's attention to page 21564 of the trial transcript. Do you have that? Line, counsel. Excuse me one moment. Excuse me, it was twenty one five seventy five of the trial transcript.
I know some, some pages appear to be missing out of my trial transcript, Your Honor. May I just have one moment? Certainly. after lunch when I have an opportunity to, to find the uh, missing pages. Proceed. Sir, after you were cross-examined by Mr. Sheck about this issue of the grand jury transcript and um, the issue of whether or not you wanted to conceal the existence of Andrea Mazzola, do you remember that? Yes. Were you trying to be careful to specify who physically collected what? Yes. And during the cross-examination, did you notice that you were still at times testifying in conformity with your habit of, of using the term I or, or yes. making it sound? Sustained. Did you notice that even after then you were testifying at times in conformity with your habit? Yes. Objection. Leading. Move to strike. Stricken. Jurors to disregard. Your Honor, I'd like to look at uh, page 22026. Okay, it's lines 23 through 25. Twenty-three through twenty-five. Do you recall giving the uh, following answer to the following question? Question, Mr. Fung, did you ever collect a pager in the caged-in area? Answer, yes. Do you remember that? Yes. Okay. Were, were you trying to suggest that you personally? picked up that item? No. And had you earlier testified on direct that Andrea Mazzola had picked it up? Yes. All right. I'd like to next look at 21916. It's lines 1 through lines 26. Through 26, line 1 through line 26, 21, 9, 16. Proceed. Thank you. 
question. Now, did you, in terms of how you and Ms. Mazzola approached this, did you perform any what is known as phenothaline tests on those blood drops? Mr. Sheck, did you? Answer, yes. And was that one of the first things that you did? Answer, it was one of the things that we did. Question, all right. Then in terms of approaching these red stains, there is one that I think is item number one. The one on the door, is that correct? Answer, yes. Question, and before you swatched that stain, you did a presumptive test on it? Answer, yes. Question, all right. And before you took a picture of that stain, you did a presumptive test on it? Answer, I'm not sure which order that occurred in. Do you recall that line of questioning and those answers? Yes. And did you, in fact, perform a presumptive test on it physically? I don't recall if I personally performed it or if Criminal Smazola performed it. Did you physically swatch it? I don't recall if I did or not. And did you personally take a uh, photograph, or did someone else do that? Somebody else took the photograph. When you answered the question about the uh, picture, were you trying to lead Mr. Sheck to believe that you personally took the photograph? No. And wh why was it that you testified in this fashion? I was, I was trying to answer his question as to what was done, not who did what. Okay. And next I'd like to uh, refer to one last portion of the transcript at 22331, lines 15 through 25. While they're looking for 22331, lines 15, through Yeah, I, I don't see it. The other one pertains to what I'm about to read. Proceed. Okay. Sir, did you give the uh, following answer to the following questions? On June 13th, you collected 112, which is 47, right? Answer. Uh, I would ask you to take a look at the previous questions. If he, I thought he was going to do it. <laughs> I thought you agreed to do that. Oh, I, I didn't know that the court. Okay, I'll read it. On, on lines 1 through lines 26, did you give the following uh, answers to the following questions? Well, it starts with an answer, but to please Mr. Sheck, we'll, we'll read that. Uh, okay, generally, answer, generally that we do our crime scene or our collection in order, but, but not a steadfast rule, though, but generally we do. Question. Well, you certainly would want to keep the photo ID numbers in order here because that's what you're using to keep track of the samples. Answer. In order, in what regard? Question. In order of collection. Answer. What kept the samples in order was that we collected each sample. We collect them one at a time and label the photo ID number into the coin envelope and place the sample that we have just collected that's been labeled in that envelope. That's what keeps track of the sample. Question. On June the 13th, you collected 112, which is 47, right? Answer, yes. Then you did 113, which is 48. Answer, yes. Question. Then you did 114, photo number 114, which is sample 49. Answer, yes. 
then you got sample 50 just near the back rear gate. Answer, yes. Do you remember those questions, giving those answers to those questions? Yes. And sir, were you trying to mislead Mr. Sheck into believing that you had physically collected those items? No. And had you already testified that in fact Andrea Mazzola did the physical swatching on most of those items? Yes. Now, <coughs> sir, how difficult is collecting a stain? Collecting a stain is not very difficult. The actual swatching of a stain is not very difficult at all. All right. And is this something that, in your experience, detectives sometimes do? Yes. Is this something that a lay person could be trained to do? In a matter of minutes. Have you seen crime scene technicians do this who are not criminalists? Yes. Now, when you testified at the uh, grand jury about you swatching the stains, was that consistent with this habit that you've described to us? Sustain. All right. Why did you testify that way, sir? I was answering the questions as to what was happening, not who. I didn't think the topic was who did what. Now, I'd like to uh, ask you a couple questions uh, on the subject of training and your training in the area of collecting a blood stain. Were you trained in how to collect a blood stain for the purposes of conventional serology as opposed to DNA analysis? At the time I was trained, it was for conventional serolo serological blood and biological. Was your first Same. actual training in collecting a blood sample at the lab at LAPD or was it in school or somewhere else? The first training occurred in school in my coursework. Okay. Did they actually have you physically collecting s uh, stains at mock crime scenes or how did they do it? I don't recall at this time whether we actually had to collect stains or not, but it was covered in the coursework. Did you also um, have some more training in how to collect stains once you joined the lab? Yes. Now, after the uh, advent of DNA, the use of DNA technology in, in uh, criminal cases, did the physical mechanics of how you collect a stain change? No. All right. And when you said you received some additional training after the advent of DNA, what was the nature of this additional training? The nature was describing to us how large a sample was needed to perform DNA testing. And that was back in the late 80, around 88, 89. So the training went mostly to sample size? Yes. Now, when you saw uh, Andrea Mazzola collecting stains at the crime scene, uh, at Rockingham and Bundy, can you describe the manner in which she would collect them in terms of her technique? Criminalist Mazzolo was very deliberate in her uh, collection. She was single-minded in her tasks, and she was... I would object to this as being conclusory if you want to ask him about specific stains that he observed. All right, ask another question. Well, did she appear to be concentrated on her task when she collected all the stains at Bundy? It's a stain. It's leading. Okay. How did she appear when she was collecting the stains at Bundy in terms of the way that she was approaching her task? He can, he can describe her conduct yes. as he observed it. She was very methodical. Okay. And did she appear to be using, the, or was she using the technique that is used in the Los Angeles Police Department for the purposes of collecting biological stains? Yes. And doing it properly? 
Yes. Now, going back to the uh, Bundy location, you were asked about a videotape that depicted an item that was being passed between yourself and criminalist Mazzola. Yes. And have you had an opportunity to look at that videotape now several times? Yes. Perhaps we can see it's uh, Defense Exhibit 1082, the, the clip of the tape. Sir, if you look closely at that, t at that tape, do you appear to be holding a pen in one hand? No. Yes. All right. Well, I was about to try to get the counter number since that's... part of our record. We're looking at the segment that's at 1334, approximately. Proceed. Sir, and is that item the eyeglass envelope, as was suggested by the defense? In Criminal Smozola's hand right here? Yes. No, it's not. And when I say the eyeglass envelope, I mean the eyeglass envelope without any packaging on it. It's is that what you meant? It's not the envelope itself, no. Does the uh, eyeglass envelope... Uh, if I may approach the witness, it's um, people's 32 for identification. Have some blood stains on it? Yes, it does. And do you see any blood stains on the item that's depicted in the defense exhibit 1082? I can't make any out. All right. When you recovered the uh, eyeglass envelope, was it relatively crisp as the item in 1082, or did it look somewhat as it does now? Objection. What did it look like when it was recovered from the crime scene? The envelope appeared pretty much the way it appears as it does now. And it already had blood on it at the time that it was collected? Yes. Now, now sir, in this particular photograph, are you wearing gloves? No, I'm not. Do you have any practice that you follow in terms of when you wear gloves and when you don't wear gloves at a crime scene? I personally wear gloves only when necessary, and that's when I am about to touch an item of evidence or I'm going into a very, very um, bloody scene. You don't wear gloves. Why don't you wear gloves 100% of the time when you're at the crime scene? For me, when I am not wearing gloves, it makes me that much more conscious not to touch things for prints. And I tend to be very um, careful when I'm wearing gloves, or at least in the, when I'm in my thought process, when I'm wearing gloves, I would be more likely to touch something me, um, because I would think that the gloves would protect the item from prints. Now, in uh, arriving at that conclusion as to when gloves should and should not be worn at a crime scene as a criminalist, did you consider the opinion of uh, Barry Fisher on that issue? Yes. And that was the same text that was cited from earlier during cross-examination? Yes. I'd like to cite from page 21 of uh, Mr. Fisher's text at, uh, that's the third edition, maybe I can approach the witness. 
Do you want to share that to Mr. Sheckford? I think he has. Sir, you've already looked at Mr. Fisher's um, quotation as to the, the wearing of gloves. Is that correct? Before yes. today? Okay. And, and does Mr. Fisher say the wearing of gloves should not be permitted on the crime scene? There is always a risk that the wearer will become careless and touch objects that bear the criminal's fingerprints, thereby destroying or wiping them out. Was that his view? That's yes. And is, is that your reason for not wearing them 100% of the time? Yes. I'll mark the page I, I, as a people's exhibit, if I might. All right. People's next in order will be defendants 190. Excuse me. People's 190. And that's page 21. Third edition. Third edition. Yes, Your Honor. Now, sir, is uh, blood at a crime scene considered to be a contaminant with respect to the uh, health of the criminalists? With respect to the health of the criminalists, yes. Why is that? The, the blood could have infectious uh, diseases in it. and it could be transmitted to the criminals. Would you touch an item that had visible blood on it, sir, with your bare hands at a crime scene? I would try very hard not to. And would criminalist Mazzola have handed you an item that had blood on it? No. Sustained. The answer is stricken. The jury's to disregard. Rephrase the question. No. Sir, uh, under the, the practices of, of the crime lab and using the standard procedures that you use at a scene, would a criminalist at the Los Angeles Police Department hand to another criminalist an item with someone's blood on it? Oh. Now, sir, directing your attention back to the exhibit, the, the eyeglasses in front of you, what is the brown paper bag that's contained in that exhibit? The brown paper bag is what the white envelope was packaged into. In looking at the brown paper bag, were you able to see what uh, type of a bag that was? It was a number, number four size bag. And the Los Angeles Police Department has various assortments of bags? Yes. Your Honor, I'd like to mark as people's next exhibit what appears to be a, um, it's a Townsend number four brown paper bag. Yes. I'll write a number four bag. I'll write a, a 191 on the rear of the bag. 191 for identification. What is that? This is a brown paper bag, size number four. And is that the same type of bag into which the eyeglasses were placed? Yes. Okay. Is that consistent? If we can see uh, Defense 1082 again. It seems to me if it's being offered as a, 
uh, I'm, I'm objecting on the grounds that I take it this is being offered as uh, is a foundational objection. Yes. Right. Exemplary evidence, and I think yeah, I that the, the actual exhibit is there. If I could just have a couple more questions before the, the noon recess, it won't take that long. Two. Okay. Sir, is the item that's depicted in Defense 1082 consistent with the item that we've just marked the uh, paper bag, the Townsend number four? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. I think we can wrap it up now, Your Honor. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take our recess for the uh, morning session. Please remember all of my admonitions to you. Do not discuss the case amongst yourselves. Don't form any opinions about the case. Do not conduct any deliberations till the matter has been submitted to you. Do not allow anybody to communicate with you with regard to the case. We'll stand in recess until 1 o'clock. All right, let me see counsel at the sidebar with the court reporter. Have the jury, please. Goldberg. Good afternoon again, Mr. Fung. Good afternoon. You're reminded, sir, you are still under oath. And, Mr. Goldberg, you may continue with your redirect examination. Good afternoon, Mr. Fung. Good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Fung, when we left off, we were talking about defense uh, tape 1082 that shows Andrea Mazzola passing an item to you. As you sit here now, do you have an independent recollection of that incident? No. All right. And when you looked at the tape, 1082, does it appear to you that the uh, item is uh, a bag that contains something or does not contain something? The object does not appear to have any bulk to it. It appears to be a flat object. But are you certain, based upon your practice at a crime scene, that you would not have taken the envelope? Had it not been in a package, had it simply been in the condition that you saw it in court with the blood stains, with your bare Sustained. hands? Sustained. Rephrase the question. Sir, <clears throat> would you have done that? Would you have taken that eyeglass envelope with your bare hands? Objection. Close for speculation. Sustained. Rephrase the question. Using your practice, your customary practice at crime scenes, would you have grabbed that item, the eyeglass envelope, with your bare hands? No. And are you certain of that? Absolutely. Now, at one point you testified that you believed that the coroners had left the location at the time that was depicted in that scene on that defense tape. Do you recall that? Yes. What made you think that the coroners had left? In my experience, coroners personnel leave very soon after moving the bodies and placing, the, placing them in their vans. And I do not recall having seen any coroners personnel after I had seen them put the bodies in the vans that day. I just didn't recall seeing them. Had you waited to uh, commence your collection process until after the bodies had been removed from the location? Yes. And by that I mean put in the van? Yes. All right. And based upon your experience in, in processing crime scenes, can you think of any reason why the coroner would remain, the coroner's uh, representatives would remain. Sustain, calls for speculation. Well, it also goes to the state of mind, Your Honor. Calls for speculation. At the crime scenes that you've been in the past, uh, are there reasons, are there things that the coroners have to do at the crime scene after they take the bodies and put them in the coroner's vehicle? 
sometimes they have to get information from the detective, but I haven't seen that happen very often. Okay, so in your, you've processed about 500 crime scenes, you, you said? Yes. And, and in your experience, does the coroner almost always leave as soon as the bodies are in the vehicle? Very soon after, yes. Now, were you paying attention when you were involved in the collection process, and by that I, I'm including numbering and measuring the, the, the various items, were you paying attention to uh, activities that other people were engaged in around you? No, I was concerned with doing my job. When you were involved in the uh, collection process, were you trying to keep track of where the coroner's representatives were, or if they were even there? No. To this day, do you have ind any independent recollection of them being there? No independent recollection, no. And uh, do you have any reason to believe that they were there other than the one clip of videotape that you saw with what appears to be the pant leg of one of the coroner's representatives in it? No. Only the videotape shows that they're there. Okay. Now, during the uh, early portion of the collection process, did you say that you brought the glove from that, that had been collected at the Rockingham location in its bag into the caged off area? Yes. And for what purpose did you do that? Detective Lang had requested to see the Rockingham glove. Do you recall from your own independent recollection whether or not you opened the bag for sure or not? I don't recall if I opened the bag or not. Have you ever had any conversation <clears throat> with Detective Lang about that incident to your recollection? I mean, after it happened. Yes, we have talked about it, but I don't recall exactly what we discussed. Do you know uh, or happen to remember whether Detective Lang said that the bag was closed at the time? Objection sustained. Limited for st his state of mind? Sustained. Now, if we were to assume hypothetically that you uh, brought the bag into the caged off area and opened it, what kind of danger, if any, would be uh, posed in terms of contamination of the evidence? Just by merely opening the bag? Yes. S something from me, like my hair, or something could fall into the bag. Uh, what about cross-contamination with the crime scene? I'm talking about that as a danger. As long as I left the glove in the bag and was very careful opening the bag, I wouldn't see any real possibility of any cross-contamination. At the time that you uh, brought that glove to the location that, uh, was, that we've described as this caged-off area, did you believe that there was some legitimate investigatory reason for doing so? Yes. Did Detective Lang tell you what it was? Objection. Well, he can say yes or no without saying what was said. Yeah. He did give some indication as to why he wanted it there, yes. Well, that was my ne next question. And it's not, limit, it's not being introduced for the truth of the matter asserted, but the effect on this witness's state of mind. Your Honor, I actually tried to elicit this. <laughs> what?